This is October 3rd, 2006. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Chris Anderson of Natick Pegasus, our cable access station. We are privileged to have with us today Gustavus R. It's not. Thank Thanks for coming today. I'm going to ask you a few background questions w before we get into your service-connected uh, life. May I ask you when you were born? Where? When and where? I was born in East Providence, Rhode Island on February 28, 1919. And you currently live in? I live in Westboro. Why did you choose the Navy? Uh, I uh, had been through the preliminary work of the draft board in my hometown, but uh, I thought with my background and whatever skills I had, I could use them better in the Navy than in any other branch, so I thought I would uh, uh, put my application in with them first, and uh, that's what I did. And did you have family or friends who uh, joined the service around the same time as you? I no, none in the family. Uh, I had two very close friends, but they uh, both went into the Air Force and uh, ended up as bi bomber pilots. And was that around the same time or prior to your going in? That was about the same time. After Pearl Harbor, things obviously got very uh, hurried and speeded up and uh, so all of us uh, looked for the spot where we hopefully could do the best and where we would enjoy the work the most. And where were you sent for your basic training? Uh, I was, we, I, my first orders were go to the University of Notre Dame. I might preface that just a bit by after I got my orders I had a letter that I needed a uniform so I went to Boston and I got an, uh, an ensign's uniform, a couple of sets of blues and four sets of whites and whatever else was needed and so that's how I became outfitted. And then uh, on uh, the 18th of May, after a, a delay of a couple of months nearly, I got orders to go to the University of Notre Dame for so-called indoctrination school. Uh, it wasn't a real broad indoctrination. Mostly what we did was get a series of in, uh, inoculations, whatever, medical examinations. Uh, also, uh, we signed up for National Service Life Insurance. And I think we did a little parading around the campus at the University of Notre Dame. But as far as uh, getting exposed to any kind of seamanship or rules of the road, or that sort of thing that the so-called 90-day wonders that went to Columbia and other places got. So I was still a uh, rank neophyte. Mm -hmm. So that uh, period at Notre Dame lasted a few weeks. And then from where, where did you go? Uh, towards the end of that period, uh, we were offered uh, a number of opportunities. <coughs> Excuse me. They. Uh, at that point, we were informed that uh, our duties were to replace U.S. Navy qualified seagoing officers from desk jobs so that they could join the fleet. So the 1,200 officers at the University of Notre Dame uh, were in the same boat as I was. They didn't, most of them didn't know anything about the Navy, and uh, so one of, the, one of the openings they had, they said they, there would be opening for 50 men at a torpedo school in Puget Sound, Washington, and uh, 50 more in Newport, Rhode Island. So I thought, here I am in the Navy, I don't want to go back 30 miles from home to Newport, so I asked that I be sent to Puget Sound, Washington. So typically or untypically of the Navy, all hundred of us went to Newport. <laughs> <laughs> so I was back home again. And strangely enough, this school wasn't the kind of school that prepares you for sea duty as such. It was a material school for, t for torpedoes. And we spent three months learning all the intricacies of the torpedo 
all the valves, the, the primers, the warhead, all the things that, a, that an enlisted man, and I speak of an enlisted man with great pride, the things that an enlisted man, a rated man like a torpedo man, second or third or first class, would know, but which an officer would never be needed to know. What an officer needed to know was, was fire control, and at that time I thought fire control was putting out fires, not directing fire. And also, I honestly didn't know which side of the ship was port and which was starboard. So after nearly four or five months in the Navy, I was still essentially a civilian, I'm afraid. Did you feel that others in your same position there felt the same way? Would you repeat that? Yes, if others, other ensigns with you who maybe didn't have any background in... Yes, there were. My, my roommate at, uh, excuse me, Notre Dame ended up in Puerto Rico for the entire war. I'm not sure I know what he did there, but he was shore based in Puerto Rico. Uh, another fine man uh, from Texas that I roomed with at Torpedo School in Newport ended up at Trinidad and he was on the island of Trinidad for the, for the entire war. I'm not sure what he did. I know when we stopped there, he was able to get a jeep and give me a tour around the island, and we had a very nice reunion, but I left him in Trinidad where I found him. And after your three months of training on torpedoes, what happened next? Uh, well, obviously the hundred of us, having been told that we would be slated for some kind of shore duty or something like that, we were interested in what our orders would be. And for some reason or other, I was the first of the officers at the Newport to uh, get his orders. And interestingly enough, it was to report to the USS Glennon. And how do you spell that? USS G-L-E-N-N-O-N. -N its designation DD, meaning destroyer, and the number was 620. So I was going to join the fleet, and I reported on board the USS Glennon in the York Navy Yard in, I think, October 10th, 1942, and got in just in time for the commissioning ceremonies. So I was with the Glennon from the day she was essentially born. So once you reported, what were your duties on a daily basis? Well, I, I was given no duties at the time. Uh, anybody, about the lowest job for a line officer or a deck officer would be to stand an officer of the deck watch in port because you just, count the people coming and going, you receive supplies, there's no decision, excuse me, decisions to be made, but uh, you just kind of stand there and make sure things go somewhat orderly. And when the captain found that my designation was OVS, Ordnance Volunteer Specialist, rather than DVG, Deck Volunteer General, he, I, I'm sure he knew he had a problem on his hands and I felt completely out of everything. I, I was not qualified and I felt like a second-class citizen. So even when we had to stand deck watches in port, I was an assistant officer of the deck, which is about as low as you can get. How long did you feel this discomfort? How long what? Did you feel this type of discomfort? I felt it for nearly probably nine months to a year. It took me a long time to learn, as on-the-job training, what, uh, what I should have brought aboard with me. Uh, Did someone take you under their wing, no. so to speak? So you learned by watching? I learned by watching, I learned by imitating. Uh, I, I, that's about what it was, just, just watching. Some of the fellows were good. Uh, there was a bond between reservists and regular Navy, and that surfaced on occasion, not to a large degree, but you always felt that there was a, a division between the uh, reserves and the regular Navy. 
but uh, we reserved stuck together well, and I made some fast friends that I have even to this day in the U.S. Navy. I fellows still living uh, in Tennessee that we correspond with occasionally, and uh, he was, he was always a, very supportive. And he was on the ship with you? Yes, he was. We, he and I were both on it from the day it was commissioned until the day it was lost. Until the day it was lost. Yes. So let's talk about that. It was commissioned, meaning it was a fairly new ship? It was brand new. It had been launched from the uh, Federal Shipbuilding Yards in Kearney, New Jersey. And a few weeks before, had been towed up to the Navy Yard to be fitted out. And when they felt that it was ready for some kind of sea tests, it was commissioned. And it just so happened that I went aboard in time for the commissioning ceremonies on the Glennon. And do you remember those ceremonies? Were there VIPs there? Yes, there was an admiral that gave a welcoming speech. Uh, most of the officers' wives, I knew none of the officers, of course, and certainly none of the wives, but they were all there. And I know in the wardroom, which is the officers' country on a ship, uh, we had salads and refreshments afterwards. So I, I met people that I didn't remember. How soon after that did you ship out? Uh, we had different calibrations for the ship. Uh, in the following month or so, and then following that, we had a lot of tra we had many training exercises. We generally went to uh, Casco Bay off uh, off of Portland, Maine. That was a training location for most destroyers, and uh, so we had uh, anti-submarine routines and gunnery routines. We never fired any torpedoes at that time. We never fired any torpedo in anger. We had one practice torpedo that fortunately ran well, and I'm not sure I know why. But uh, other, than, other than that, uh, our, our practice area was in, uh, off, off of Portland, Maine. And then where did you go? Um, I know in, in our conversations prior to this taping, you talked about going overseas. When did that occur? Uh, our first assignment after our training exercises were to uh, escort some uh, tankers, new high, reasonably high speed, 15 knots for a merchant ship or a tanker was good speed. We, uh, our first uh, convoy duty was to uh, take uh, three tankers from Galveston, Texas, by way of Aruba and Trinidad to Dakar, West Africa, and then up the coast to uh, Casablanca, and then back home, and probably some more training work, and then we went back again to Galveston and uh, picked up the same three ships and took them back to Dakar and up to Casablanca. So those were our first two convoy trips with the Glennon. And as you went on these convoy trips, did you have more of a comfort level about being at sea and helping on the ship? Yes, I, I began to settle in and I learned, uh, I learned a great deal by observation. Uh, I always stood a watch on my watch, although it was an assistant, whether it was in port or underway. So I, I had a good opportunity without the direct responsibility of watching and learning what officer the deck did, the captain would be on the bridge often, and uh, I could learn from the intercourse between he and the officer of the deck what was expected. So I, I learned rather quickly. Now these trips that you took, leaving from Texas and then coming home, what was the time span between leaving and, and returning? Uh, with those ships we could cross the Atlantic in 10 days generally. And then after you did these two convoys, what happened? From that point, uh, uh, we had missed the invasion of North Africa. We had not gotten involved with that. But at that point, there was a, a large buildup of forces in the Mediterranean, uh, anticipating, not known to us, but anticipating the invasion of Sicily. So from that point on, we uh, were one of the escorts in many convoys into the Mediterranean. Uh, 
We'd stop at Gibraltar on occasion. Sometimes we were there long enough so some of us got a chance to uh, climb to the top of the rock. And uh, we often would go through, always go through the Gibraltar Straits and uh, stop at Algiers or Oran or Mirs El Kabir. And we were there waiting for the ships that we took over to unload, so we had time in those ports. Some of us got shore patrol duty, and uh, if one, one of the officers from our ship got shore patrol duty, where, which meant they could go into any section of Algiers, then the word would be out and he would take some of the rest of us all through the Caspar and the native sections of the city. So we got to see a lot of the cities that we stopped at. And when you went to these cities, how were the people from the community, how did they treat you? Uh, they, they were all fine. They were, they, if anything, they were courteous. Uh, because of the language and uh, my French being non-existent really, there was little communication, but uh, th they were they were not unfriendly, and uh, they I, at that point uh, they were the free French and they were glad to have us there. And the ships that were unloading were they unloading supplies? Yes, they were unloading some trips, but some troops, but mostly supplies. Yes, ammunition, food, that sort of thing. Now talk about you had said briefly at the beginning of this interview about when the sh ship was lost. Um, fill us in on what occurred with regards to obviously the ship uh, meeting up with some combat. Yeah. Talk about that. Uh, could you be more definite? Well, you had mentioned earlier that the ship was lost. Yeah. Talk about that. Or oh. is there a lot? Okay. Uh, that's fine. So we have some continuity, and I may have mis misled you. Uh, our frequent trips to the Mediterranean led to the buildup of troops in North Africa. And uh, in July of 1943, <coughs> excuse me, we went to, we were a part of the escorts for a convoy to Sicily. And we took part in the invasion of Sicily, and our location in Sicily was Gela, Gila, G-E-L-A. So we were a support system for the troops going ashore, as well as the protection for the merchant ships offshore. So we were called upon from various times by a shore fire control group to, to supply fire from our ship to the enemy that they spotted in on Sicily for us. So we did have good luck. We stopped a couple of German advances from our destroyer and uh, that went very well. We were there for a few days. One thing there, the Germans had complete air superiority uh, at, during the inv our invasion of Sicily. Uh, they wouldn't come over much during the daytime because our uh, ships had good anti-aircraft fire. But uh, at night they would come over and drop flares and they could see us and we couldn't see them. So it was, a, it was it, that part was a little scary. And we weren't that busy, we were just waiting for something to happy and happen. And when you're not busy you're apt to get a little concerned. Uh, finally, after two nights of that, one uh, second night, uh, our sister destroyer, the Maddox, was bombed and sunk right away with very few survivors. Also, a ammunition ship was hit and and burned for days. And that was nearby. So and that was very close to us. Yes. So, uh, after a couple of nights, those wiser than ourselves directed us to take all the merchant ships south, generally towards Malta, where fortunately the German aircraft did not find us. So after the second night at Gala, Gala uh, things were very quiet, and we'd return during the daytime with the, with the merchant ships, the supply ships, and uh, take part in whatever shore bombardment we could, we could supply. However, by the end of the week, 
the, our troops had advanced so far inland that our guns would not reach the enemy. So our work there was done and we took the empty ships back to North Africa, Oran, Algiers, wherever. Did you feel, uh, along with your other shipmates, a sense of relief that you were taking them back? Yes. It was always a matter of satisfaction. It, you couldn't see what was happening and you had to take the word from the Army Shore Fire Control Party, but uh, they were very generous in their praise of us and so the satisfaction was, was very great. Uh, shortly after we'd taken the ships back to uh, North Africa, we returned to Palermo, which is a harbor, a, a city with a harbor on the northern part of Sicily. And for some reason, uh, every ship we owned practically was in the harbor. And they were jammed in quite closely. And at night, the German bombers came over and Patton bombed the harbor. Uh, as a result of that, we had our first casualties. Seven of our people were wounded. Uh, none too seriously, I don't believe. So they were on the ship with you? Yes. And the ship got hit? They were on the wing of the bridge with us, and uh, yes, my, generally my battle station or my position on the ship was on either wing of the bridge, and uh, that's where most of the casualties occurred. Do you remember your sense of fear then, or discomfort? What was it like for the, you? As I said before, the, the nighttime bombardments were, were the the scary, if you will, parts because you couldn't see them and they dropped flares so they could see you and you felt like it was sort of an uneven battle. Mm -hmm. But uh, their bombing missions didn't last all night, probably a couple of hours and uh, away they went and we were okay, most of us. So you had mentioned also that the Germans had superior air support versus yeah. The U.S. Um, yes. Did you have air support, though? I don't remember any air support at all at Sicily or at Palermo. I think Palermo was an isolated one-time surprise attack that caught many of our ships in the harbor, so they had a good opportunity to do some damage. But uh, evidently, and I'm not sure of this, the, uh, the Sicily invasion locations were too far for our planes to cover. Now, I don't know that, but I just assume it. So once you were in Palermo, um, did you get word where you would be going next, or was it all pretty secretive? No, we stayed there only one night, and I think we picked up a, a, a two or three merchant ships and two or three destroyers, and we again, we returned them to ports in North Africa. And by then, other merchant ships had become unloaded, so we took them back to the States to be refilled. So we had like a milk run back and forth in the Mediterranean for some time, pretty much through 43 into the uh, summer, through the summer of 43. Then what? Then what happened uh, of particular, perhaps interest, uh, in November of 43, we left Norfolk, Virginia, with a sizable um, convoy, a number of escorts, and many merchant ships. And uh, we left in the afternoon, and the convoy got formed up. And uh, when nighttime came, there were ever, obviously, there was a a coastal steamer of the United States going down the coast from north to south. And even with radar, something got messed up and that coastal ship cut one of our sister destroyers in half. Uh, hit it between the bridge and the forward stack and the forward end of the uh, the forward end of the, of the Murphy, it was the USS Murphy, the forward end of the Murphy sunk rather quickly with the loss of many, a few lives at least, and the after end stayed afloat. 
And uh, we were in a position with another destroyer to put our whale boat in the water and go out and pick up survivors. So we picked up a number of survivors and uh, before the night was out, the other destroyer that had picked up survivors brought them the, to us. So we had all the Murphy survivors on board our ship. Is it because you had a good medical team there that could... Yes, I, I think our skipper, he, he was a, a tough, tough but fair person. He, he was the one of the four captains that I was with that I can honestly say I admired for his skills. And do you remember his name? Clifford A. Johnson. Uh, by the time we got all the survivors on board, the after end of the Murphy was still afloat with a number of their survivors still on board. So we approached them and put over a line and took them under tow and headed back towards New York. And the following morning, a ski to a sea tug came out and relieved us of the after end of the Murphy and also picked up whatever survivors we had. And at that point, we continued, we caught up with the original convoy and uh, went on. And I think this was our first trip to Great Britain. And we went to uh, Northern Ireland. Belfast, Northern Ireland was our port. When you were in port in Northern Ireland, were you able to get off the ship and have some free time? Yes, yeah. And, and, and do you remember uh, that? From that point on, we, not frequently, but we, uh, on, a, on a number of occasions, uh, our, our destination in Great Britain was uh, Belfast. So we would often go to the same clubs and establish a few friendships and uh, sometimes reconnect with them later on. Uh, we stayed in Belfast a few days until the ships got unloaded or others were ready to come back to the States. And uh, so we headed in November back on the, on the bad weather, November uh, back through the North Atlantic with our convoy. Uh, I don't know if this is the time, I'll try to make it brief, but the weather forecast, we get a forecast every day, and the, and the uh, weather forecast was pretty ominous. And it, the weather was getting worse each day, and uh, everything topside had to be tied down. When we left the port, we had extra supplies, food and that, and quite often it, it ended up uh, topside on the ship, so that had to be tied down. And the weather got so bad that finally, uh, normally in a convoy, our lifeboats were hung outboard in their davits so they can be lowered quickly in case of an emergency. But the seas were getting so bad, they were 30 and 40 feet high. It was just about as bad weather as you can get in the North Atlantic. And so we had to rig the lifeboats inboard to keep them from getting swept away. So we were preparing for a, rather a severe night. And uh, I was on watch at the time and uh, we got a message on the radio, it's TVS, it's a short for talk between ships. And up ahead of us on one of the merchant ships, a merchantman had fallen overboard. And we got a call from the ship saying a man overboard. And uh, so we transmitted that down to our combat information center, which keeps us posted in our position with the convoy and what ships there are. And knowing the name of the ship and its position in the convoy, someone made some quick calculations. And, and we were two or three miles behind the convoy in order of any submarines were to approach us from the rear. Uh, so they made a, a guess of about where the spot uh, the man would have fallen overboard. So, uh, we headed for that spot, and before long we got there, but the seas were 40 feet high. Absolutely no chance of finding anybody in that kind of weather. And so we, we couldn't even think of finding him, but uh, we commenced searching in a pattern of ever-increasing squares so that each, 
each square would be further, 50 yards further than the other, and we continued in, in sort of circles, but they were squares, and we were only allowed a half an hour to look for them because they wanted us back with the convoy for whatever protection we supplied the convoy. So the time flew, it goes faster than you believe, and I happened to be on the port wing of the bridge, and uh, we are just about on our last leg before we joined them, and I thought I heard a voice, and I said, Captain, I think I hear a voice, and somebody else listened, and they did. So the captain said, put the, put the, the searchlight out, up forward, and he put, we put it out and shown it in the, in the darkness of the night, and there was a man with his hand raised up. So we said, fine, we would slow down at that point to try to locate him. And so we had lost steerage way. And the gales were coming in from off our port bow, and he was off our port bow. So we started ahead, but we couldn't swing the ship to the port to get steerage way to get him. So the captain had a bullhorn, and he said, we'll be back. Whether the man heard us or not, I don't know. But the skipper had to back down a mile or so in order to get steerage way and come up on the windward side of the man. And it was just a guessing game if he could ever find him again. So a lot of our men went over to the starboard rail in case they could see him, but some of us stayed on the port side in case we hadn't gone to the right side of him. And after a while, unbelievably, we found him again, and this time on the port side. So the captain jockeyed the ship back and forth, letting the wind set us down onto the man. We put a ladder over the side and got him aboard. So for that, the captain got a lot of commendation, which is another ribbon for him, and we took the man back and left him in New Jersey. So that was an exciting convoy. We, we had the Murphy to begin with and Mr. Lemmerman to end with. And uh, after we'd gotten to New York, Mr. Lemmerman's wife baked a big box of cookies for the crew. And his name was Lemon? Lem William J. Lemmerman. Lemmerman. And I tried for years and years to reach him. I don't mean to digress. And many years later, probably 1994, I talked to Norm Nathan, and he got no response in WVZ. And uh, one of my shipmates had a son, and he got on the internet with some kind of a directory, and he found about 15 Lemmermans on the East Coast. And one was a William J. in Florida. So right away I got the information and called the number, and I, a woman answered, and she said, I said, is Mr. Lemmerman? Yes. And uh, I said, is Mr. Lemmerman there? And she said, no, he isn't. And I said, is this the Lemmerman that was in the Merchant Marine during the war? She said, yes, it is. I said, well, I'd like to speak to Mr. Lemmerman. She said, I'm sorry, he died a few years ago. Oh, my, yeah. I said, you must have been the lady that baked all the cookies for us. She said, no, I'm his second wife. <laughs> so I don't always say the right thing. But did you feel a sense of pride that you were a part of that search and rescue? Oh, yeah. It, you know, a person is always just a microcosm in the whole, whole scheme of things. Sure. But you do think that you had a part in it and you get a lot of satisfaction. And I later get a, a letter, and my, my story was published in a paper. I later got a, a very nice note from a fellow on another destroyer in that convoy that heard that we were going after the man and said he couldn't believe that we'd find him and he was so glad to know how it came out. Mm -hmm. So everybody was interested in it that heard about it. Mm -hmm. So talk a, a little more then after coming back from that. Uh, you went back and forth between yeah. the U.S. and Europe and the yes. Mediterranean. Did it ever get boring to you? No. Uh, each, each night in the early evening, we always would get a submarine report of German submarines. Uh, our, our communications and our, our radar and our wireless had gotten so sophisticated that they knew where perhaps not all the German submarines were, but where many of them were. And they would send us to that in a coded message and we would uncode it 
and if we saw any, if we knew of any submarines in the area, we'd be that much more alert. Mm -hmm. So we, from time to time on some of the crossings, we would get a sonar, that is a, a sound contact with what we thought was a submarine, and we would pursue it. On a few occasions, we dropped patterns of depth charges. Uh, we never had assurance that we had gotten a submarine. We may have scared some off, we may have gotten one, we may have had a false, a false contact. But we, in all the con convoys, we were con all the destroyers were continually, op continually operating their sonar to try to detect submarines. So we were alert, and they weren't, they were not, they were reasonably relaxed, but there was always something that could go on. Talk about uh, Normandy and the Normandy invasion. Okay. Were you and was your crew a part of that? Were they a mm -hmm. part of support? Yes. That, that, of course, was our last trip to Normandy. We had made eight round trips, uh, convoys, to, to Europe, Africa, somewhere. And this was the start of our ninth round trip. And uh, we went again into Belfast. I had, I, at that time, we had never been into uh, England or Wales or Scotland. We'd always been in Northern Ireland. And again, we went to Northern Ireland, and uh, we, at that time, we were certain that the invasion was imminent. And uh, after a short stay in, in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, the ship was sealed, and information was brought to the ship on what our part would be in the invasion of Normandy. Now, explain what you mean by the ship was sealed. Uh, there was only a select two people that could leave the ship, and they, they were picked for some reason. It wasn't I, but they were picked for some reason. But I don't think anyone ever left the ship but perhaps the captain and the executive officer. And that was to have conferences or to pick up later dispatches. We'd already gotten a general plan of the invasion where we would be involved, perhaps not for the whole invasion, but for where we, where we would be involved. So the time came for the in invasion to take place. I believe the date was set for June 5th. So we left uh, our anchorage off of uh, Bangor, Northern Ireland, and with, a, with merchant ships, supply ships, and a few escorts, we started down the Irish Sea. And we got nearly down to the channel, and that was the time they changed the, the date of the invasion to the 6th. So we turned around and went back up the Irish Sea for 12 hours and turned around again and we were right on schedule. So we got down to the southern end of the Irish Sea and into the channel and uh, I had been selected, and I don't know why, to be officer of the deck to take the ship into our position off of uh, Utah Beach. So the, the hours from 12 to 4, when I was off to the deck, were, were very interesting. They're very eerie. There were ships everywhere. You couldn't see them all, but everywhere you looked, there were ships. You had to change course and speed to avoid hitting them. But eventually, about 4 o'clock in the morning, we ended up at a shore fire control location off of uh, Utah Beach, Normandy. Did you have a sense with your peers of the danger that was ahead of you? I, I, I don't think we, we could take into our minds the enormity of it. I think it took, it took me probably years to realize exactly what we were in the midst of, but we knew it was important, so uh, we just went on, and there was something going all the time, so you didn't have a chance to do much but tend to business. So we got to our position in a swept channel off Utah Beach about 4 o'clock, and at that point uh, the captain went to general quarters, which means all the, the entire ship goes to whatever battle station so they will be available be to, for whatever they might be needed for. So we. Uh, we stayed uh, 
we waited for calls from the shore fire control people ashore so, so that we could help them drive back from Germans, but the, uh, the lines were so fluid and, and undefined that we couldn't, we did no firing all, all of D-Day. And the end of D-Day, most of the destroyers went out, out away from the beach uh, to protect the merchant ships and the supply ships and the battleships and the cruisers from any German submarines or e-boats, and a German e-boat was a torpedo boat, from coming in from the extremities to damage our, our, our forces at anchor. So we would spend the night patrolling out there to protect the merchant ships and the battleships and the cruisers, and then at daytime we'd come back into our fire support position quite in close to the beach. The D plus one, was a very satisfying day, I sure. And if I could interject here, you that's go the, ahead. the day after, the second day yeah. of D-Day. Yeah. And this is D-Day plus, plus one. Plus one, right. The, okay. s the seventh. Mm -hmm. uh, we returned to our shore fire control position, and uh, we did get messages from the group ashore, uh, and they had gone inland some distance, and according to them, we had driven back a couple of German divisions. It's a little a division I always thought was about 20,000 men, and it's a little hard for me to believe that we stopped 40,000 men or 20,000, but evidently we deterred enough of a German advance to help our troops ashore, which was what we was there for, for one thing, and gave us a lot of satisfaction. I think we uh, fired on two or three other occasions, and that the, those were the only calls we got from our shore fire people ashore. So that was the 7th? Yes. So the night of the 7th, we went back outside the merchant ships and the destroyer, the cruisers and the battleships to protect them again from the German submarines and e boats and whatever. And we had no contacts. I think they were reluctant to come because we had quite a formidable force there for them. Uh, we came back early in the dark hours of the 8th to our position and I remember seeing the one German plane I saw all during the during the uh, invasion. I happened to be off to the deck at the time and it was a HE-111 German bomber. I, they dropped the bomb but it didn't hit anybody and they continued away so there was there was we had control again, we had complete control uh, of the invasion areas air aircraft wise. To see a German plane uh, over the ships, you really, really never did. Very, very seldom. So as it got dawn, we continued on into our, our support system, our support area, and again, I, I took over the officer deck at eight o'clock. And about Eight, fifth, eight, twelve minutes after eight, there was a tremendous jolt to the ship, and we had hit a mine. And it broke the after thirty feet of the ship. The number four gun mount was detached from the ship. How many gun mounts did you usually have? On What's that? How many gun mounts did you usually? We had have? four. Four. You had four. Yeah, they were five-inch, thirty-eight caliber guns. Two forward of the bridge. Then there were some torpedo tubes and two for the aft. And the very aft one was on, located on the fantail and above the sleeping, one of the sleeping compartments for the enlisted men. So it, it broke the ship in half just forward of the uh, number four gun mount. And uh, instead of breaking the propeller shafts, it bent them down. And we were in shallow enough water so that we were, we were stuck to the, to the bottom of the bay. And, we, and the captain, the, the forward end of the ship, the forward 80% of the ship was at that time in good shape and the captain wanted to save it. So he called for a tug to try to tow us out and save the forward end of the ship. But we were hung up on the, on the ocean bottom by our propellers from our bent propeller shafts. 
So we were there and he tried to get a, a, another sea tug and, and that would do, no, we jettisoned all the heavy equipment overboard and, and nothing could, could do it. But at that point, being a stationary object, we became a good target for the German shore batteries. So they started to shell the ship from the shore and they had reasonably good luck, unfortunately. So the captain called one of the cruisers for some support because we knew generally what some of the German gun emplacements where they were. So one of the cruisers, I don't know who, took that under fire and that silenced the German batteries for a while. Yes, we, uh, we were essentially sitting ducks even though the, uh, the uh, gun support we got from the outer edges of the transport area had, had slowed the German fire down essentially to a stop at that time. Uh, the captain began to be concerned for the safety of the crew. A whole crew wasn't needed on the ship at that time and I happened to be on the bridge and he turned to me and he said, I, I want you to take half the crew including all those that are wounded and we had 41 wounded at that time and half the officers back to England and the only other thing he said was keep in touch as best you can. There happened to be a minesweeper tied up next to us. It was a USS staff, S-T-A-F-F. -F. So that large portion of the crew, essentially half the crew and half the officers, got on board the staff. And that included you? That included me. I was in charge of the group. And he took us out into the transport area and there were a lot of LSTs that had completely unloaded their tanks and equipment and men out there and they were empty waiting to head back to England. And LSTs were cargo type? LST was a, was a generally truck tank carrying vehicle a long, maybe 300 and some feet long, like a large floating bathtub. And they had a big lower deck with a, with a front would drop down on the beach so that the trucks or the tanks could come out. Okay, thank you. So he, this uh, skipper of the staff took us out to an LST and all the Glennon people under my command, under my charge, uh, went aboard and uh, we found a place to, to sit down and uh, that was probably middle of the afternoon. That was of the uh, 8th, D plus 2. And uh, the skipper of the LST came up to me and said, are you in charge of these people? I said, yes. He said, we've got a bunch of German prisoners and some French snipers over in the corner here and we got nobody to guard them. I don't think they're going to cause any trouble, but I got to have somebody to guard them. Will you people do it? And then I said, certainly. So uh, the officers and some of the enlisted men from the Glennon guarded the German prisoners and the French snipers. There was no interaction between them except uh, some young army private spotted a German soldier that had some kind of a insignia that his group had, so he wanted it back and he was going to go over and I was afraid he might do some damage, so I just uh, had the German prisoner pass the insignia back to this young man and everything was quiet after that. So we left uh, late, late in the afternoon and uh, the LSTs are not fast ships, they maybe get eight, seven, eight knots. So they took us back to England and we landed in Portland Harbor. So I made sure the wounded people got taken off to the hospital and the uh, English folk put us up in a barracks there overnight and uh, whoever needed more clothes got them and we are sort of a ill-clad bunch but we made out well. What was, what was the sense between all of you? Did you feel that you were lucky to be alive? Were you relieved to be away from the battle? How yeah, we, did you we, feel? Were, we were happy with our condition but we were a little sad that we weren't still all together, that we had drawn the long straw. 
but you take what you get. So I guess overall we were pleased where we were and we hoped the rest of the gang would come along just as well. And did they? They did. All of them. There were no more. There was maybe one more casualty, a, a slight wound, but all that we had left on the Glennon returned and were reunited with us. Now along with the wounded, was there loss of life from... Yeah, we lost, yes. I should have said that we had lost 25 of our enlisted men. They probably, the, most of them were in the after sleeping compartment and during those days sleep was in short commodity. We, you could get what you wanted when you could, if you could. And probably many of them were in that last uh, after compartment underneath the four inch gun, four, number four gun. And uh, I suspect it's only a assumption that they probably drowned there. Some were hurt when they were blasted overboard. We picked a number of the wounded and just the regular swimmers that had been blown overboard in our own whale boat. So, uh, but to answer your question, those that we left on the Glennon all were, came back to us. The 25 that were killed happened almost right away when the mine exploded, I'm sure. Jumping ahead a little, tell those listening to the tape about your search for those 25. Uh, after the war? After the war. We'll go back to a few other questions, but tell, this is a nice time to talk about All what right. you've done. Uh, I was always concerned of where they were memorialized, and I assumed being lost during the invasion, they would be buried in Omaha Beach Cemetery, or perhaps repatriated to their home cemeteries in the States. So later, after the war, probably not until the 70s or 80s, Mrs. Ida and I traveled to Europe on occasion, and we always made it a point to go to whatever cemetery we were near, and if we weren't near there, we'd make an overnight trip to one. So we covered most of the American cemeteries uh, that were made for World War II. So our first stop was at the Omaha Beach Cemetery. It's just up the bluff from Omaha Beach. You can walk through the cemetery and look out over the invasion beach. And I had a list of the 25 people we had lost, so I uh, went to the superintendent and we went down the list and I found that three of our men were interred in Omaha Beach Cemetery. So I, uh, I uh, said, well, I guess all the rest of the boys got sent home. So uh, even years after that, maybe six or eight years after that, we were, uh, we'd gone to the Margraten Cemetery in Holland and had gone down to the Ardennes Cemetery in Belgium. And I, just to see the cemetery and, and to see how lovely and beautiful they are. And on the main building in the center of the cemetery, there was a plaque and there's always a, a plaque on the wall or on the building showing those that were uh, not found or if they were found not identified. So they had a wall of missing so I happened to see on a wall of missing had U.S. Navy at the top and I said here we were hundreds of miles from deep water. I wonder what the Navy was doing here. So I read the names and I got to the second or third one and I said to my wife, honey, I know these people. And for some reason seven of the Glennon men that were lost are memorialized in the Ardennes American Cemetery. So gentleman standing nearby asked if he could help. He was a fine gentleman. He ha happened to be the superintendent of the cemetery. And so I told him my whole story that I generally told you. So he said, I, I'll, I have a book and I'll look up the names of the rest of the people. So he found thir that 13 of them are memorialized on the wall in the Cambridge Cemetery in England, which is still a long distance from Omaha. I guess I wish if they had to be memorialized somewhere, it would be at Omaha Beach, but the, the government can't make changes, and I understand that, so at least their names are somewhere to be recognized. So it's been a rewarding experience, 
and there were two left, and I find out from the American uh, Cemetery Service that one was brought back to uh, Baltimore to a, a military cer ceremony and one to his hometown cemetery. So 25 have been accounted for. But it's because of you that they've been accounted for also. Well, which maybe is a very somebody nice else story. has done it, but I, I, I happened to get a letter into the Tin Can Sailor magazine, so anybody can share it with me. Sure. So now you're back in England. And how long did you stay there before you came to We were in Portland again? for the night of the 8th. And we got up in the morning. And it was a terribly busy place. I was, you know, I don't know how any kind of order could have been kept. People did a wonderful job to keep track of all these thousands of people. So they had a truck convoy ready for us. So all the wounded that could be mobile they didn't have to stay in the hospital, and the rest of the enlisted men and the officers got on the bus on the truck convoy, and we went south to, I've forgotten the name of the town, but the Red Cross put on a very, very nice steak lunch for us, and plenty of cigarettes for those that smoked, and, and uh, we had a good lunch, and we got back on the trucks and went down to uh, Bristol, England, where we were put up in some kind of Quonset huts or other sorts of things. So at that point, I, I felt a responsibility to try to be in touch with the, with the skipper. So I went to a, a sort of an information section there that had many of the answers, and I asked them what they had. And they said they, they had nothing. And uh, that was the ninth, and so we stayed overnight again, and we went back on the tenth, and they said that the Glennon had finally been so full of holes from the German uh, batteries that it had rolled over and sunk, and uh, that the survivors had left. So uh, the next day, the eleventh, lo and behold, in Bristol came the entire rest of the contingent from the Glennon. And at that point, uh, Bristol had gotten so full of people they wanted to get them out. So, uh, were they all, mostly American? What's that? All American or mostly American? All, just about all American, mm -hmm. yes. So uh, at that point, uh, we all the Glennon people boarded a train. We had K rations for food, and we had an overnight trip up into Scotland. Uh, I think the location was Roseneath. It was quite a large estate. The captains and executive officers were put up in the, in the mansion of the estate, and all the rest of us were in Quonset huts around the estate. And we were there probably close to two weeks. The, the first part of the town, most of us were required to, to make a, make a uh, statement of, of all their experience during D-Day to the captain so that he could make out a complete report for his people. And the rest of the time we played pickup ball games. Those that wanted to go to the local pub, it wasn't far away. So uh, we all lived happily there for nearly two weeks. And we got the word that uh, the uh, Queen Elizabeth, number one, was going to be leaving Greenwich, Scotland in a couple of days. So we all went down to the dock and we got a lovely ride home on the Queen Elizabeth. It took about five days to cross the Atlantic and we celebrated Fourth of July crossing. We got back to New York and the officers, I don't know where the enlisted men went, we got put up at the Commodore Hotel. And at that time, uh, we were notified that there was a general notification throughout the Navy that Lieutenant JG's of a certain date were promoted to a full lieutenant, so I had two full stripes. And after a few days, we went home for 30 days of survival leave. I went back to Rhode Island, East Providence, and did not much for 30 days. At that point, I got orders to go to gunnery school, which was a, a real thorough school in Washington, D.C. And it happened two other officers from the Glennon joined me there along with a gunnery officer from one of the other destroyers. So we had a, a, a family of people in, in Washington, D.C. 
And we were there for, th for three months. And uh, following there, I got orders to go to another destroyer that had been in service uh, even longer than the Glennon had. It was the USS Mervine, M-E-R-V-I-N-E, Mervine. I've forgotten the number, DD something. So uh, as gunnery officer of the Mervine, we made uh, three more transatlantic round trips, mostly into the Mediterranean, and I'm not sure why. I would have liked to have gone back to England, but we went to the Mediterranean. I suppose to, uh, because the latest invasion had been into southern, southern France. So uh, that, that and a lot of training, I suppose there were plans for the invasion of Japan and destroyers were needed for their anti-aircraft abilities. And uh, we were also, also they wanted some high-speed mine sweeps. So in perhaps April, May of 44, no, yes, we, yes, about early 44, we went to Philadelphia for a couple of months, it was April of 44, for a couple of months to be converted from a dis full FUDS destroyer to a destroyer mine sweep. And that mainly involved taking the number four gun mount off and putting on uh, an elect uh, magnetic tail that we could stream behind the ship to, to detonate magnetic mines. We went to uh, mine sweeping school, so we became somewhat proficient in mine sweeping. And we had, uh, so had sonar equipment to uh, detonate sound activated mines. So we were prepared to, to go uh, to the Pacific and take part in whatever was necessary in Japan. So we went through the canal in early August and we were somewhere south of uh, Mexico on uh, the 8th, which I think was VJ Day. So uh, we got into San Diego and uh, they had a point system. Married, married people got 10 points right off the bat and that bothered all we single people. But I, had, and you got so much for every month of duty and so much for every sea duty so my points had added up, so it was not too far from getting out of the service. So I got off the ship in San Diego, and the rest of the boys went on to the Pacific to sweep mines around Tokyo or whatever they had to do. And I stayed in San Diego for a while, and then in November, uh, I had just a few months left, so I was sent to Newport for an ineffectual job there. And uh, along about March, I was released to an active duty with like a couple of months leave left. So I said, I think I'll finally go see the West Coast. So I took a, a vacation to the West Coast and came back and I was out of the service. And that was March of 45. That was 1946. 46. I'm afraid I said 45 when I said we were converted to a high-speed mine sweep. And boy, is that wrong. That was 45. That was 45. And, and what rank were you discharged? A full I, lieutenant? I was left as, I, I, yes, as a full lieutenant. 